Hi, welcome everyone uh, to tonight's Alumni Career Pathway Series. Uh, I'm Shannon McKinnon, the Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning here at Emily Carr. And tonight's panel is taking place at Emily Carr University, which is located on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So uh, tonight's film panel is part two of the Alumni Career Peer Pathway Series, an annual three-part panel series, which is sponsored by RBC and presented by Alumni Relations in collaboration with Career Development, Work Integrated Learning, and the Shumka Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. This series hosts alumni panelists and moderators who demystify career paths for current Emily Carr students. Uh, I would also encourage you to check in with the QR, QR code on that table, and you will be entered to win one of three Opus gift cards. So, and with that, I'm going to introduce our alumni, Alan, who is our moderator tonight. And uh, yeah, take it away, Alan. Thanks. So, okay, so we have, we have sound, yeah. Okay, so um, my, yes, as mentioned, my name is Alan. I, I actually work here at the school. I am, uh, I have a fancy title called Industry Liaison for Research. What it really means is that, that I'm a Walmart greeter and I try to help people um, come to the school and do research and research projects with us. Um, I am also uh, a documentary filmmaker and, and active in my practice. So I'm really excited to host this panel and be a part of this. Um, not host, sorry, moderate the panel. And good to see all of you. And I know a lot of you are film students, so this is great. Um, so the word demystify maybe is a good place to start, but that's kind of what we're going to try to do. So on my left is Kevin. On my right is Emily and Jen. And I'll just quickly read their bios to you. I'll try to abbreviate where I can, because they've accomplished a lot of stuff. So Kevin is an award-winning writer, director, and producer based in Vancouver. Uh, most recently, he wrote and directed British Columbia and Untold History, a critically acclaimed documentary series that won five Leos. Leos is an award, a very prestigious award here in, in uh, British Columbia. Uh, he was nominated for Canadian Screen Awards by the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. Previous credits include Humboldt, The New Season, After the Sirens, and I'm abbreviating because this is an awesome bio, The Death Debate, uh, Emergency Room, Life and Death at VGH. I think, was Melanie part of that? Melanie Wood? Yeah. Oh, she was not, but oh, she is. Okay. Uh, in addition to his directing work, Kevin is an accomplished producer. His credits as a producer include the award-winning documentaries Haida Modern, Vancouver, No Fixed Address, Haida Gwai on the Edge of the World, Oil Sands Karaoke, and Echo Pirate, the story of Paul Watson. I think I've seen that. It's great. And feature films Prego, Fido, and The Delicate Art of Parking. Parking. And the Gemini Award CTV movie Elijah about the life of Canadian OG Cree politician Elijah Harper. Did I get most of that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and Emily Bach, Kai Bach, is uh, born in Toronto, graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, from Emily Carr in 2008. What, what year did you graduate? date myself, but oh. 1999. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. With a focus in painting a sculpture, uh, soon after, gra didn't mean to put you on the spot, um, soon after graduation, she relocated to Montreal and began co-managing the art collective and performance space Lab Synthesis? Syn Lab Synthesis. Synthesis. Okay. There she began to collaborate with local musicians and artists on live performances, pieces, documentaries, and music videos. In 2012, her music video for Grimes, Oblivion, became a viral and critical success and brought her commercial representation as a director in the US and abroad, where you reside now, right? Yeah. She began making music videos and commercials for hire, working with artists such as, a Ar such as Arcade Fire, Lord, Solange, and Grizzly Bear, and ads for brands such as Google, Toyota, Yves Saint Laurent, Vogue, and Hennessy. Uh, in 2017, her debut short narrative film, A Funeral for Lightning, 
premiered at TIFF and went on to be nominated for a Canadian Screen Award, as well as winning the Grand Jury Award for Best Short Film at the LA Film Festival. She is currently in development on another short narrative and her debut feature film. Okay. And on her right is Jennifer Lee. Jennifer is a multidisciplinary artist who finds passion in directing, filmmaking, illustration, martial arts, and photography. Cool. She's been a professional stunt actress whoa, uh, for many years. And with her unique background, she wishes to continue exploring and expanding her skills as an artist and storyteller, striving to tell stories that are moving, action-filled, and inspiring to the audience. God, we need those. Uh, she has a unique journey at Emily Carr. Uh, she was telling us about it. <laughs> and an inspiring to the, on, uh, to the audience. She has a unique... Oh, I read that already. Sorry. Uh, with her capstone short film, Sold, being awarded the President's Media for Excellence in Film, as well as the Sarah Lee James Memorial Award and Canadian Cinema Editor's Student Merit Award. She believes in hard work and a humble mindset and strives to be a down-to-earth, down supportive and collaborative leader and team player. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm really lucky to be talking with all of you guys um, and appreciate you coming today. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Emily. How did you go from where you were as a graduate of Emily Carr, 2008? Do you remember those days and... and and how you got to this place? What 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 got you going? What because you had a background in as a visual artist, right? Um, I'm just gonna speak into this. Uh, so, um, my, man, looking back, cool. This is actually helpful, unless it's conflicting. <laughs> Hello. Um, this is a small room, so I feel like it's unnecessary. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I think back to, it's, I haven't been to this new campus, so the school's like metamorphosized into this massive like monolith when I, when I walked down like this, that road. <laughs> what is that road, the main road? It's Great like Northern Great Northern Way. Way. Yes, I actually lived like off of it um, on Main and Six and I would bike to the old campus at, at, a, at um, False Creek and, um, yeah, it was like it was a beautiful bike ride along the seawall, and and I'm and yeah, it's just amazing to be here again. Um, I don't remember your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question was like, you were you graduated in two thousand and eight? Yeah. Um, did you know what you wanted to do when you graduated, or were you sh you know think yeah? How did you get into it? Um, well, I. I I feel like my path to film was like extremely uh, meandering, and um, I, I didn't exchange to a school in um, New York, uh, and I there became demystified with the art world. I feel like, <laughs> in the sense that I it, it was uh, a sobering experience of of living in New York and going uh, to like shows there and being like part of like a painting like you know, the sculpture installation community and, and making sculptures there. And, and uh, I came back to Vancouver, like, really appreciative of this school. And I love my time here. And I realized how, like, what a gift this school was. But it fostered, um, it, it didn't really, I came out of graduation deciding I didn't really want to be a, a con contemporary uh, vis visual artist or, like, a, a, a gallery artist. Um, so I just, I moved to Montreal because I had a friend that was moving to Montreal and um, got involved in, in uh, I wanted to hang out with other active artists and um, people that were devoting their lives to art and it seemed like the most vibrant community of artists that I could come across were musicians. So I organically became friends with a lot of musicians there that um, kind of taught me this practice of waking up and making your music even when no one's like paying attention and no one cares and there's no because when you leave this uh, this beautiful greenhouse of a school and you're like thrown into this like late stage capitalist like c commerce <laughs> driven world and then you're expected to continue an art practice um, it's you know, next to impossible it really feels like y you are thrown into the 
wolves of like you have to survive and make you know um, like pay your rent and also have enough hours in the day to make an art to make an art practice somehow. Um, so living in Montreal was I was able to live, move into an art space where we paid our rent through live shows and we'd have musician like music bands play and we and we'd charge five dollar door and that was like how we were able to live rent free and have like a large loft space to like play in and in, in, in sense of make installations and performance spaces and music like sound pieces and like it was just like a bunch of very driven probably alcoholic but whatever like <laughs> like free-minded people that that were all basically living on part-time jobs and the other part of their life was um was devoted to some sort of practice mostly music um and then my roommate had a camera, and I just started filming and documenting, interviewing, because I just found these people fascinating. And like, they, 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 you know, some of them were Quebecois and like had Ifo like spray painted on the walls, which was, uh, it means like you, you, you must or it is necessary. Like art, you have to do. And I think I struggled with. Um, um, not needing to do art because there wasn't a professor or classmates, or any kind of structure of saying you had to. <laughs> like, no one cared if you made art or not, mm. all of a sudden. And uh, from going from weekly crits at Emily, Emily Carr here to, to all of a sudden being in this vacuum of like, I made something and no one cares, and there's nowhere to show it. Like, I don't, I don't like, I, especially leaving the Art World Network here and going there where no one knew where, who I was or what I made or if I made anything at all or, you know, so, um, I think that camera kind of provided a way to, um, you know, like the Duchamp idea of like an artist's job is to point. Mm. And uh, because it, I was making mostly ready-mades, I like, I remember my fourth year painting class, I was bringing um, my professor and classmates to um, these like grease curtains these greasy curtains hanging in an auto body shop because I thought they were like beautiful. And so we had like wine and cheese for these greasy uh, <laughs> mechanic shop curtains, which the professor, my, which I wish, I wish I remembered his name. He, he, he appreciated, he said, this is what you find beautiful. This is, this, you, you can, this is like the ready-made, this is, can be your painting. And I was like, and I think that really, ble I think this was such a prog progressive pr professor of painting that he allowed me to hand in as a painting assignment these 50-year-old greasy curtains that I had never touched before, but I said, like, that's, that's what I think is a beautiful painting. And, uh, <laughs> and I think through documentation, like, if I hadn't started documenting these things through, through like, you know, like as, you, as you have to document a sculpture, I started to document uh, performance pieces that I wrote and directed and casted my friends in. And then through that process of editing the, the documentation, um, I realized that I could change the meaning of the um, work by putting the beginning at the end or the end at the beginning. And then I was like, it felt like a eureka moment of like, I have discovered this new uh, genre of art making. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's montage, that's cinema. <laughs> and it's been around for a hundred years. Uh, so then I, 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 I was like, maybe I should uh, learn more about film. And then I, I basically started making music videos for these musicians. Um, and then one of them was Claire Grimes, who ended up becoming successful. And I wrote her coattails to uh, get representation um, as a commercial director, but um, which, is, which is a whole other beast. And I don't think <laughs> I would advise many people to go down that road it, um, because you don't have a lot of creative control um, when, you, when, you, when you are a director for hire. But you do pay the bills, so it's a catch twenty two. But um, that's my long whew, winding road. Well, that's that's yeah. a cool story. Um, well, uh, well, <laughs> let's come back to that in one second. But um, Kevin, maybe you can tell us about you. You were it was it was uh, almost Y two K, and you were uh, <laughs> you were entering the workforce and thinking about what you were going to do. You were getting out of this place. What 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 was happening? Well, we were all worried about Y2K, <laughs> destroying everything, the economy. No, um, we were, though, but that's really funny. That seems, 
I must sound so old. We have to so know what Y2K is. Yeah, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, really? We're really so it was, dating it was the ourselves. the fact that when 2000 arrived, all the clocks and computers were going to roll over to a bunch of zeros, and that was going to just mess up everything. And the idea that, like, bank machines, commerce, industry, everything was going to just be destroyed. <laughs> Traffic lights wouldn't work. We'd all be crashing. Planes would fall out of the sky. We'd lose all our money, etc. So this, you know, because in the era of computers, there'd never been a turnover to a new century or new millennia. Anyway, I just, that, I'm, I just had to share that since you didn't know that. There was a bunch of movies made about it. Plus, there's lots of people that all thought that the world was going to end on December 31st, 1999. They, they did. Yeah. yeah Spoiler, did. it didn't. Anyway, um, this microphone sounds weird. Can, Can you, you hear me if I just project, or is that going to mess up the recording? Okay, then I'll talk this way. Um, so, I don't know if it, oh, that does, that has a nice, nicer mix. That's great. Um, it's, I thought that was just Alan's smooth voice. Um, <laughs> So when I graduated, I uh, was fortunate that I had done an internship in my the, between my third and fourth year at a place called BC Film, now called Creative BC, which is the provincial funding agency for film and television. Now they've brought in to include a whole bunch of other things like magazines and book publishing. Um, but so that was kind of my real opportunity to get a sense of like how you actually get movies and TV shows and documentaries made in this country because um, you don't usually learn that in film school. Uh, you learn how to you know, use the tools of a camera or an edit system or things like that. But um, I and certainly most of my peers upon graduation had no idea how you actually get money to make something. So I was very fortunate. I had just by coincidence done this internship in the summer of my between my third and fourth year. So when I graduated, I went and got a job there. I was just an administrative assistant. Um, but that allowed me to basically meet everybody in Vancouver slash BC um, who were making films because that was like the script development office. So for those that don't know, but like there's Telefilm, which is the national funding agency for Canadian feature films. And then there's the Canadian Media Fund, which is for television. And then at the provincial level, we have this Creative BC. So I was, you know, my, ostensibly my job was answering the phones and, you know, getting the mail out and stuff. But they were very uh, great in letting me get involved. And I would just, like, read all the scripts that were coming in that were being submitted for funding. And that was a huge education. I always see my, like, film education in three chapters. I worked in movie theaters at the age of 15 through end of Emily Carr. That was my first, like, film education, seeing the ritual of how people actually go to the movies and what's involved and what they experience when they do that. And I had, you know, got to see tons of movies for free. Um, and then my formal education, Emily Carr. And then the third part I always saw is working at BC Film and seeing how movies were made and meeting all the people, like, you know, people would come in with their applications and I'd just start chatting with them. And so that's how I met a lot of directors and producers in this town. So because of that, um, I really knew who everybody who was like trying to get something made in this town were. And after doing that for about a year, not even, I was like, okay, enough of that because I don't want to just kind of work behind a desk for too long. Um, I'm going to try to get a job at one of these production companies. So uh, I started phoning around some of the people and they knew me because they had either known me at BC Film or actually from working at the Fifth Avenue Cinemas, which is where one of the movie theaters I'd worked at. And I talked about movies with them. So I would like call up the directors in town that I knew. I was like, hey, I'm wondering if you would have any need to hire an intern. Um, and the first two places were like, we have no money. Uh, and if we did, we would be hiring this other person who's been volunteering. Another place was like, uh, we just can't do that right now. And then finally, the third place I called, they're like, oh, hey, Kevin, yeah, like, we enjoy talking about movies with you. Um, as it so happens, we are just about to go into pre-production on our first feature film. Um, but we don't really have any money. I was like, oh, well, good news. There's this fund. I found out like that there was an internship they could apply to. So the that would foot the bill for my wages. So they didn't have to worry about paying me. They basically got a free intern. So I basically went and started working for them. And that was like a few weeks before they started official pre-production on their first feature film. So I got in on the ground floor of like what became, uh, you know, for many years, a big production company. They were called Anagram Pictures. And we made several movies uh, there. And that's that was how it happened. I, I got in, I started as like an assistant to the producers on their first movie. And I just quickly started 
you know, grabbing balls and running with them. Like I remember they would say like, we have no idea how to do our tax credit application. And I was like, I'll try to figure that out. So I would just start doing things. And by the end of that movie, I was the associate producer. I had gotten like promoted. First I was the assistant and then I got, then they're like, well, what are you doing now that we're finished filming? Do you have to go somewhere else? I was like, no, I have nothing else lined up. And they're like, okay, we'll hire you as our post-production supervisor. So then I became the post-production supervisor and then led to me being the associate producer. So that was how it all started. And then I stayed there for seven years. I was an in-house producer. That was their first movie, which was Andrew Curry's Mile Zero. And Andrew Curry ended up going on to making a movie called Fido, which I was also a producer on. And that was about a boy and his pet zombie. It became a cult hit. It stars Billy Connolly and Carrie Ann Moss and that premiered at Sundance and played all over the world. And yeah, and then after that, I kind of was like, okay, I need to strike off on my own and do my own thing. But that was how it started, was, was literally just kind of, uh, kind of being an intern at a local production company. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that, that is inspiring. So, so over to, to Jen, I mean, what, what's, um, tell us about your story. You've been at Emily Carr in one capacity or another for quite a while, right? So you were doing other things while you were doing your degree sort of in bits and bites. And then what, what happened? <laughs> I'll show you. Yeah, you, you've got that one. I think it should. It should Hello? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is pretty good. Um, so, yes, uh, let me see how I should start on this story. I started at Emily Carr initially in uh, 2012 when I first graduated from high school. Um, and I really loved drawing and painting. And at the time, I wanted to go into Emily Carr for fine arts or animation or illustration or something like along the lines of that. But I also practiced um, martial arts growing up. I practiced like Chinese internal martial arts, like Tai Chi, Bagua, and then I also loved uh, watching the Hong Kong martial arts films growing up. And along that path, I kind of stumbled on into this martial arts called uh, martial arts tricking. And I started training with, um, unbeknownst to me at the time, like stunt people. And I became friends with them and I was like, wait, you can do stunts? Um, and that's a, like a career. And then I started becoming more interested in film. And then as I went into Emily Carr into the second year, I was like, hmm, I can go into art or I should maybe try going into film and I could learn more on the technical side of it. And like, you know, that's also just a very creative thing to do. And I just love being creative. Um, so I went into film and then I pursued stunts kind of at the same time. Um, so I guess in a way, like I was pretty lucky that I kind of got into film through kind of a dis different aspect. And I only graduated this past year in May, 2023. Um, so that's like kind of like a, a long journey and I'm very grateful. And you know, from the, like everything that I've learned from Emily Carr and all the support I got from my amazing instructors and peers. Um, but yeah, so I started Emily Carr, went into film after going into like pursuing stunts. And then as I, kind of went into it, I started getting more work in film. And I think that's a really valuable experience, like whatever direction, however you get into film, because just being on set, like working with all the amazing people you get to work with in film, you just learn a lot. Um, so yeah, and then I would get jobs. And one of the more memorable experiences for me was, um, I think it was at the time, like I was in second year, I think I was in Christine's class at the time. And then I was like, oh no, I got this uh, email. I have an audition for an opportunity to go to the UK to audition for Star Wars 8. And then I was like, oh, okay, well, I talked to, her, I talked to Christine and she was very supportive and I ended up going there, did the audition. And then I got the role to stunt double for um, Kelly Mary Tran in Star Wars 8. So, like, I guess my career is just kind of like, oh, I want to finish Emily Carr. I want to get my film degree. And then my parents are also like, oh, you should, you know, finish your, your thing. You started it. <laughs> um, but then I would be, like, working and then trying to do school at the same time. And it's really hard to juggle. Um, so that's why it took me a long time. But I'm also grateful in that journey, too, because I've gotten to take that time to myself and... Also, just with that learning process, I got a lot, gotten a lot more life experience. So when I did and 
end up like finally finishing my grad film, I feel like I've had a lot more experience, a lot more connections and resources and you know, people that I can trust to come help me with it. Um, and then also within stunts, like there's something else that I was very grateful that I got to um, do. Like, cause so I do stunts and I also do acting. And then another thing I, I've gotten the opportunity to do is uh, something called um, like action previs or action pre-visualization. Basically, um, you create like a prototype for the production to showcase the action side of filmmaking. And so you, for me, it would, I would get hired through the stunt department and I'll work with the stunt coordinator and we'll go to either like a rehearsal space or the actual set and they'll design the actions, whether it's fighting or the stunts. And with the stunt performers, stunt performers that we have access to will we'll practice it and they'll act it out and do the action as well as they can and I'll basically work with the stunt coordinator to film and also edit it so we have a prototype to show production for um, like, to basically it's a communication tool like storyboards to um, communicate with the directors and producers and the actors. Um, and I feel like that has helped me a lot with um, in terms of directing actors and also just working with, in collaboration with other people in production. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the story, roughly. That's awesome. Uh, neat that you could do both things like that and sort of, you know, be juggling between the two. Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of, I'm interested to know, I mean, careers are kind of moments, right? Uh, or am I incorrect? Like, are there a series of moments for you where you feel like, uh, you know, you had kind of understood what you needed to do? Because you, you're... Are, you're really in, in behind the camera and trying to figure out what it's going to look like in front of the camera. Like, how do you um, take that moment that you're, you know, when did you feel confident enough that you could, like, do this, that you could take this on kind of thing? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I guess, like, the, the training I received here was like you, from foundation, is like you have a vision and you execute it, and you usually execute it like as an individual. <laughs> you don't even talk about it to anyone else. You just build something. Like you, basically, you maybe like have a little meeting with your professor before you know you pre pre before the, the day, or but you usually don't, I didn't even really even share it with my peers what I was making or what we were working on. We all had our like little closed off studio spaces that you would be like hammering away on something, and and then you reveal it on the crit day, so, um, and then you get a bunch of feedback, but it was often like everyone was working very isolated. So I think the biggest challenge I had was like working collaboratively uh, on a film set because you physically cannot, you can't like physically create a movie as an individual. Like, so, so coming from a sculpture or painting background, it was like, for me to like even tr begin working with a cinematographer, let alone like everyone else that's like, all the other department heads, like to, to, to wrestle the camera out of my hand <laughs> was, was, you know, took a lot of trust. And then, um, and then from there, you know, handing things off to like a, produ a production designer or um, an editor I'm still getting used to because I feel like editing is such a, yeah. is such a huge part of yeah. um, writing. And so I usually, we, I usually do a first pass of the, of the edit at least. Um, but yeah, I, I guess like um, I, I didn't, I, it, it was just one of those things where you have a vision for a film and then you, it's the exact same thing as having a vision for a, a installation. Um, you just start to gather the elements. So like if it took me riding my bike around finding locations and street casting actors um, and then in getting a DP on board, uh, you know, it started with me shooting everything myself and then starting working with a cinematographer and then it started working. And then I think the next thing I started working with was, was um, a location scout. You know, once I started working, um, making commercials, it was like you, all of a sudden you have like 100 people under you. And so you're, you kind of <laughs> like, you just start to be, have to get really good at delegating and communicating. Um, and so I just I just literally followed the framework of being a visual artist and like 
that I learned here. Like, I, that basically just understanding that you're, you just have to put, stick to the vision, <laughs> don't, try not to compromise, uh, fight really hard, and, and communicate as well as you can to your heads and um, everyone on board. And, and um, eventually they start to trust you, start to work with people that, that you get along with and trust you and um, that you're friends with, which really helps, I think, working with like a grumpy old AD <laughs> who looks at you like, you, you know, like who is this girl is a, uh, um, can be very like uh, difficult and you end up just having to prove yourself, prove yourself that you, that you do know what you're doing. And that I think like once you've proven yourself to amongst like a bunch of talented people that are your friends that want to come on board with you and work with you, which I think you guys can find here in this kind of, I think yeah. you guys work on each other's projects, isn't that how? Yeah, I think yeah. they do, yeah. If you stick with that that um, model um, for life, then you have essentially all the elements you need. You just need money. <laughs> and once you get the money, then you can hire all your friends and have a blast. But um, <laughs> so, so, yeah. That's a great answer. Um, well, Kevin, how about you? Is there a particular moment in this journey or a series of moments where you felt like, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm here, I'm, I'm doing this thing, and I, I kind of feel like I understand what, you know, I, I'm on top of my world kind of thing. Was there, maybe not, <laughs> I don't know. The answer is no. I mean, I, I, I still don't feel that. I mean, uh, it's really hard. And I know that's not the thing you want to tell a bunch of people who are just about to try to go off on it, but it's brutally hard. Um, and like the body count of the people who don't make it in the business is high. Like, you know, I had an exceptional year at Emily Carr. We're, we were all close friends. We, it was a really creative, magical, wonderful year. And I'm friends with lots of them to this day and they're all over the planet. But I'd say half of my film year are still making films and that's a really high number. Um, and, you know, as we already referenced the year I graduated in 99. So I've been doing this for professionally 24 years now. There's lots and lots of people I've worked with who I was like, oh my God, this person's gonna be hugely famous. They've won awards, they're at the top of the game in Canada, and they've checked out. So, um, I'll be honest, like, no, I've been doing this 24 years, I still don't know if I'll get to do it next year. It does feel, but I'm an independent filmmaker, I make documentaries, I make independent feature films, so I'm not playing in a super commercial space. Um, there's obviously much more stable past to go, even if you were in film. Um, but for me, I, the reason I think I've lasted is kind of a commitment to the opposite of a moment. It's like, I'm just in this. This is what I want to do. I've known that I wanted to make films pretty much all my life. Um, that might be foolish, <laughs> um, but that's what I wanted. And it was kind of more important to me than anything else. So I've sacrificed most other things in the pursuit of that. And that's facilitated that dream because that's what I'm doing is it's the pursuit of that dream. So yeah, financial stability, long gone. Um, you know, the stability of partnerships and relationships, that's pretty much at risk often. That's not anymore for me, but like those are the real stakes that you face as an independent artist. Um, and it gets hard, like, you know, I don't, I'm, whatever, you can figure out the math. I'm the age I am, but I don't have kids. There's no way I could have continued to be uh, pursuing the path that I do, which is I get to make the films that I want to make. Um, and uh, I've let that drive everything else. That's a certain personality type that I don't, you know, <laughs> think is necessarily always healthy. Um, but that's just the way it has been for me. But there's huge stresses to that. I mean, I have lots of friends who I'm like literally worried about because they'll like go all in on a feature film of theirs that's an independent feature that I think is a brilliant masterpiece, but it's Canada. The five customers that you have in terms of broadcasters and distributors go out of business on a regular basis. So they finance their project and then Super Channel will go bankrupt for a while. And then they disclaim this project, meaning that they'll suddenly say, even though they've got a contract, they're not gonna be give you your money. And so my poor friend is then on the hook for 50 grand and trying to pay his crew. And even though that's not a huge sum of money, that makes him suicidal. And that's, that's a real story. And like, fortunately, he survived. <laughs> But like, that's what you play in when you're making the most expensive art form there is. It's different than what it costs to get a bunch of paint on a palette. It's making a movie. Um, so that was a really downer answer, but I feel it's also good to be honest. 
Um, yeah, and I'll just, uh, maybe I'll add a little bit of my own experience in there because um, I, I completely echo what, what Kevin is saying. And, and uh, I, think you, I think the important thing with film is, and, and this is something Emily has said too as well, is that building a, a really great team of people around you that you can collaborate with, that you can rely on, that are in this on this boat that you're charting somewhere together. You're not exactly sure where, but I cannot, in independent filmmaking, that is really crucial because you have to really trust your your your, your fellow sailors for, for the most part. Now, I, I would like to ask you, because you are freshly graduated in some ways, <laughs> what can you tell this graduating class right now about your successes and your path and 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 what would what advice would you give them? Because they're they're going out there into the, the 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 big bad world. But but I'd love to just hear your thoughts about that. Yeah. Oh, I keep forgetting and like wanting to grab. I think mic. I think so we can actually. Hello. Hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, your mic is falling down. So try, oh. Try, try okay, that. I'll try this one. Hello. Yeah, I would say like go going back on what Alan and um you know. And Emily and them all saying it's, it's like having a good support system and having people that are your friends that are very talented and that you're happy to collaborate with and you trust each other is really important. Um, it's interesting for me to think back on that because my original classmates that I first went into film school with in 2012, 2013, like they've all grad, like all, all since graduated like long time ago. So when I went back into Emily Carr like last year to to do my grad film, I kind of had to redo that process of like meeting everyone and kind of gauging out what everyone is interested in. Like I was very lucky, like my class was like, my classmates were very talented and they were all like really good people. But at first like going into it, I was very nervous. I think I emailed my instructor Carlos and I was like, um, I haven't been in school consistently since like, many years ago and I don't know anyone, like how am I gonna approach this? Um, so yes, keep in touch with your peers, could keep in touch with your instructors, like they're really valuable assets and um, resources for you to, you know, get that support to create the things that you wanna create, especially like, um, yeah, they're just really, really good to have. Um, and then also I would say, yeah, volunteer on each other's sets, just go out there and do the thing, do the thing that you love and just keep practicing. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. And if something feels like scary to you, but you're also really excited for it, that's at the same time, I think that's a good sign that it's something that's gonna challenge you and it's a good learning opportunity. Like even me coming to this panel today, I was like, oh my God, my public speech, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I try to push myself to, to do it. Um, yeah, and just, be confident. There's always an element of like, you fake it till you make it. And there's a lot that, there's not not everything that you can already know before you go onto a job, especially when you want to challenge yourself. So just go and do it. And if there's things that you need to learn on the day or study or research or ask people beforehand to be ready, you can do that. So do that. <laughs> and don't let anyone tell you not to, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it if it's something that, you really love and you're passionate about, um, you have to fight for it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful answer. Um, so let's turn to something uh, a little, we've done the career practical advice thing. Maybe we can talk a little bit about um, some of the interesting challenges that you're facing. Is there some, I mean, is there some new project that you're working on that you're really excited about and that you can tell us about even a tidbit of information? <clears throat> Might as well keep the okay. tradition. Um, uh, I, I, um, I'm trying to think of like, like that you said like, this is the most expensive art form and <laughs> it really is an unfortunate situation that it is because it is such a, like it, it, I'm always so envious of partially musicians that they can pick up a guitar and just like play every morning and like the amount of days on set you get in a lifetime, like you could probably count that like, and so probably, I mean, even like Scorsese, what is that? Like he's probably been on set like 
less than a year of his life, you know, like if he adds up all his movies. So, um, I mean, he's like an ultimate example, but <laughs> maybe two years. But like, if, if I were to um, count how many days I've had on set as practicing as a director, I, it'd be under like 30 for sure. So I just, I'm thinking of um, um, practice and um, so recently, um, I received a Canada Council grant, which was my first ever grant. Um, and I've applied for a few. I've applied for actually quite a few. <laughs> so uh, there's hope, kids. <laughs> keep 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 applying. Um, but this is like uh, I think like the the problem is that you need to create a body of of work to get gr even grant money. So how do you create that body of work before you can? Uh, and I think like school is, a, you, you definitely, you guys have, are creating a body of work right now. Um, uh, for me, it was, it was music videos, which um, I know other filmmakers um, that I'm friends with that are, they all started that way because you're receiving a budget of like f either 5,000 or 20,000 or 30, like depending, depending on the label, but that you have money basically to realize an idea and you can make that idea like quite narrative if you if you like if the band's down with it then you can essentially make a short film um that's six minutes long or five minutes long um and that was how i was able to build a body of work was uh through music video budgets um which is a little bit of a hack because then you can you can be con continuously inspired because you can write get an idea pitch it to the band and then um Within two weeks, you're shooting it, and then within three weeks, you're editing it, <laughs> and then you, within a month, you have what popped into your head, uh, like now, physically there um, in front of you. And you can shoot on film. You can shoot. You can practice. Many. You can work with actors. You can. You can. You can uh, play. Like you can have go hard in the paint, man, and and just make whatever crazy experimental. If you want to use a, a rig that you've never used before. Um, if you want, you know, whatever, if you want to go like Michel Gondry on it, like make the whole video backwards or like Spike Jones, like all these, the, there's so many filmmakers that got their start with um, uh, Jonathan Glazer, like with music videos. So I feel that is some, I just wanted to add that to the advice pile because How I think. How many of those did you make? I've made over 15 tw to 20 music videos. Wow. Yeah. Just like in that style, like get the idea. Yep. Yeah, at least 10 in that, it, uh, for it was like, the, I heard the song, closed my eyes, saw something, wrote it down that night, like put it into a treatment, sent to the band, then they were like, okay, we need to buy the end of the month, and so you, th then that you would rent the camera for a weekend, <laughs> try to like maximize the budget as much as possible, and then you're editing, and then, um, and then all of a sudden you're watching it, and you're like, wow, like, I, I just realized, like, I was able to get from what was in my head onto a screen, um, in less than three weeks' time, and that's because uh, because of the, how high the turnover for, and I, maybe I got my start also at the heyday of YouTube. But like I feel like YouTube was, um, I sound like such a grandmother, but <laughs> back then YouTube videos, like people were really watching music videos on YouTube. I feel like that was, I feel like people are not watching, paying attention to music videos as much these days. Maybe I don't know, but it feels like there was. I came up with a time with lots of music video directors like. Daniels and uh, um, Hiro Murai and like a bunch of great, um, yeah, great. That were they were all pumping them out, and I was like a peer amongst them. Pump like just we were just all making music videos nonstop. And uh, anyway, so I kind of burned out doing that because <laughs> it doesn't pay. You don't make any money. Uh, you really don't. You could. You. I would put all the money I had, the entire bu budget, I'd shoot on film, I would, I would just work for free. Um, and eventually doing that for years, I did that for about five, six years, and I was like, I just physically couldn't continue that lifestyle because I was like just in super broke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not sustainable, but I, I was able to get enough work to, to leverage myself uh, uh, I paid for a short film by signing a contract, <laughs> by selling my soul to a, c a commercial representation that um, that that promised me a short film if I signed a contract to to uh, be represented by them um, in the United States. So, 
So that was how I funded Funeral for Lightning, my, my debut short. And then this, I feel like I, because um, the Canada Council has provided me this budget for this film I'm working on now, I'm all of a sudden off the hook uh, to make commercials for the first time in my life. Um, that I'm like seeing the Canadian dream. Of, like, <laughs> took me going to the United States to realize the Canadian dream, um, uh, which like you, I'm sure you, you're saying that is maybe it's on a nightmare also. But, um, but it seems like what a country that we have, we support our artists here. And I know, I know that a lot of American friends of mine, they basically, if you look at, if you look at most successful filmmakers in like if you look at the great American filmmaker they're great whatever they're mostly rich kids like a lot of them come from uh tons of their yeah they all like Spielberg all of them they all were like very very um I mean they could afford NYU they 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 got their first films paid for by their parents um, they're ex and not to discredit them because they're insanely talented, but like it is a rich man's sport. It's like it, it reminds me of like people who compete in the Olympics in horseback riding, and you're like, how did they get to? Me? It's like oh, because they are Bill Gates' daughter or Bruce Springsteen's daughter or whatever. So like you, it feels like if you want to get really good at like, at, yeah, you need to own a horse. So how do you own a horse? Um, so what are the scrappy ways to get a horse? It's like volunteer at a barn, <laughs> um, steal a horse. <laughs> uh, what do you, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, work at a camp that, that shovel horse shit. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess like for me, it was like you got to ride if you made horse music videos. <laughs> <laughs> made me something, rented a horse for the purpose of an, a commercial, or uh, made horse food commercials. <laughs> well, we're really exhausting the horse metaphor. <laughs> this is a bad metaphor. I'm sorry, anyway, not when go ahead. No, no. Well, yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll, that's yeah. a good segue. We, Kevin? I was just going to echo what Emily said in that, like, um, we were really lucky actually to be in Canada, despite whatever our, what I was talking were kind of the universal stresses of being an independent filmmaker, being an independent artist. I don't think it's about Canada, but Canada, like I remember the first time I went to Sundance, which was with a movie called Fido, and um, that was really eye opening because I realized to a bunch of American independent filmmakers, we're the envy of the rest of like the independent filmmaking community in North America. Because as Emily was talking about, you either have to be rich to make a movie in the States or the other usual model is like people are like, okay, I need somebody to foot the bill for my movie. So they go and appeal to a bunch of doctors, dentists, and lawyers to give them money to make a movie. And that's how lots and lots of movies have There's been made. That's how Coen Brothers yeah. made Blood Simple. Um, and there's lots of less illustrious examples. Like if you ever want to have a reality check of how unspecial you are to make a film, go to the American film market and discover that <laughs> 7,000 feature films are made every year in North America. 7,000. And guess what? Most of those don't see the light of day. And yet it's a full movie. <laughs> it had actors. It had people show up. They managed to convince a bunch of crew to make it. But that's usually crap. Um, and so that's the illustration of the flaw in the design of that model of where you're just appealing to doctors, dentists, and lawyers is because as much as those guys might know a lot about medicine, dentistry, and the law, they don't know what makes a good movie. And um, in Canada, generally speaking, and there's a million people who disagree with me, well, not a million, but there'd be 35,000 people um, that would disagree, but the people that are, of the, that are the gatekeepers to the money in Canada generally know a thing or two about movies. They might, you might not agree with all of their opinions, but at least that's what they do for a living, is read scripts and decide whether a project is worth getting funding. And that's, they're way more qualified than the random neighbor who makes money doing something else that you might appeal to in the States. And so it's actually a pretty good system. Um, and we do have Telefilm Canada, we have Creative BC, we have the Canada Media Fund, and all of those places have an obligation to give money to you, to Canadian filmmakers. You just have to be better than the next person that comes knocking. And so it's still competitive and doesn't mean you always get support and you might not always agree with their decisions, but if you keep going and knocking on the door on a regular basis, the, uh, uh, the odds kind of work in your favor eventually. It's just like being an actor. An actor is a terrible life because you're auditioning 
100 to 500 times for every time you actually book a part. But same with being a filmmaker, any artist. You just got to keep trying. You just don't give up. You keep pitching. And in Canada, at least, you have a shot. And, you know, this is where I'm doing the flip from what I was being all doom and gloom before. Like, so first of all, that's the good news, is that you just need to be better than the next person asking for money. But it's also never been more affordable to be a filmmaker because it, it, the digital revolution has changed how much it costs to make a movie. Um, you know, when I was making my first short films, like Emily, I was shooting on film. Like when I, the year after I graduated here, I made a short film and we shot it on 35 mil. And you know, to get an Airy BL4, which is like the camera they shot Empire Strikes Back on, like cost a bunch of money. And even if you get a huge discount from the camera house, it still is crazy expensive. Just to the undertaking of making a short film costs lots and lots of money. Now, that's not the case. You can get a really great prosumer digital camera. Heck, we, we you know we all know that the creator was shot on a Sony FX3, like a not expens expensive camera. And so you can actually access the tools to make a movie. Um, and the other good news part that people don't talk about enough is there's, you know, you're not necessarily ready for this now, but in a few years, maybe, you can get cast. And by that, I mean, that's just the shorthand of like movie stars for more affordable rates than you ever could have before. Up until the financial crash of 2008, to get a movie star in your movie cost you at minimum hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's all different now. And people don't talk about that enough in independent film circles, in my opinion. There's this major fragmentation in movies. There's only the low budget stuff and the stuff that costs $200 million. And 200 million to market it, which means it's like usually a half a billion dollar endeavor. So that's like, that's what clogs most of the movie screens is that the stuff on that end. And then there's films that are much more affordable. Um, th there's not enough roles in just the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for all the actors out there. There are lots and lots of actors who want to just keep working. And there's never been a time when more great actors are working in independent art house fair. And that's really encouraging. That was not the case 20 years ago at all. Um, but that's all changed. I mean, because the scripts are lacking, so they, they, they well, there's that too, yeah. and so they're more interested to do that. But like you know, I, the, the last movie I produced, the Prego Land, which you mentioned, um, we had Danny Trejo and James Con, the late James Con. We got that was a 1.7 million dollar Canadian movie, and those guys were very affordable. You can always find actors to appear in a film, but the best strategy is to offer them something they're not normally getting. That's how you get somebody who's worth a million to 20 million in somebody else's movie, you can get them for in the tens of thousands if you're offering them a role that they don't normally get. So that's how we got Carrie Ann Moss and Fido. Carrie Ann Moss up until that point had, you know, just come off doing the Matrix movies and she was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to maintain that as a career choice because I'm getting too old, people won't cast me for the PVC clad vixen in an action movie. So she wanted to play a maternal, romantic, warm role and that's what we were offering her. So that's why she did Fido for, a, a much better price than whatever she was paid to do the Matrix movies. Same with James, uh, same with Danny Trejo in Pregoland. He was known for always playing like the Mexican badass in movies and we were offering him a comedic part. And he was like, great, I'll show up for a fraction of what I'd normally charge. So those are the good news about why it's an exciting time to be a filmmaker. Uh, I'm inspired to get out there now. Um, so what, what about associations and professional affiliations? Like, are, are you guys joiners? Like, how about you, Jen? Is there a group, like, are, are you, you have to be part of a stunt association, I would imagine, to, in order to, like, is there anything that you have joined or become a part of that has helped you? Hmm. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I have not thought about it. Um, let me think. As a stunt performer, um, I guess I, when I think of stunt groups, there's like, I think Stunts Canada, there's like, a, I think, there's, there's a couple, but they're kind of prestigious in, to some level. Like you can't really join it until you've become really successful stunt performer. And I'm not in, when, um, in any of them yet. Um, but as a stunt performer, um, I guess it would be like the union, like the, the performers union. It would be the UBCP ACTRA. Um, for Canada and then for US would be like um, SAG. Um, and that's just kind of part of the working experience is like once you're in and you get your first credit and, like, and you're allowed to work in the union TV shows and film uh, films, then that would be the union that you join. Um, and 
in contrast to like um, actors and background performers, which has agents like stunt performers, you're kind of independent. You're you're self-employed. You don't really have an agent to push for you. You, for me, like personal experience, basically you train the skills that you need or that you know that you basically are good at and you want to specialize in um because the film is like it covers many different areas and for me it's martial arts and like film fighting and you make a demo reel you would make a resume you have you get like your headshots and then basically it's just through um sending that out to like different coordinators for different shows and then trying to get those opportunities to work on set and then building those trusts and relationships so that eventually they'll want to hire you more um but there's not really a group that you join to get work. It's kind of, you're your own agent, basically. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, that does, that's a great answer. Um, Emily, how about you? Are you part of like uh, the Director's Guild or what, what's your situation? I'm, I'm in the DGA, but it hasn't, it's not like the DGA uh, does, you pay the fee and <laughs> they give you health insurance, maybe, if you make the quota shoot days. Um, uh, and then you get to go to some fancy screenings sometimes, but it's like, <clears throat> um, it's a boys club. I don't know. <laughs> it's cool. I, uh, I, I don't know. I, um, I just, I just want to re 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 reiterate that like you become what you do. So you just keep doing what you want to become by just by doing it. And you, you guys are in the, um, you're in the greenhouse. So keep, Keep doing, like, take advantage of this time where everyone is paying attention to what you're making and you have all the people on hand uh, to, to do it. And then when you leave this place, keep, as hard as it is, keep writing the scripts and, and getting your friends together to make them on. Like, I still shoot on film, so I don't know if it's, a, <laughs> if it's feasible, but, um, but I always try to carve that money out of the budget because I just, I'm, I'm in love with celluloid. I just really like it. I, I can't. 35 mil? Mm -hmm. 35, yeah. I, uh, I can't, I don't know. Every time I shoot on digital, I'm, I'm just, I'm just annoyed by like the skin tone and the dynamic range. And I just, I, I've shot with Alexa a lot and I just, I, I'm just really, I really, I'm a, I want to be a filmmaker. I want to, I want to shoot on film, man. I, I just really, I'm, wow. I will, I will sacrifice the whole shoot day for, for the budget of, and I mean, I shoot a lot on short ends, so which makes it kind of affordable. Which is like you can find dealers that will deal you recans and short ends. Um, you just have to, which maybe is more feasible with music videos because you don't need long takes, so you can do stuff that's less than four minutes or, um, you know. Does everybody know what a short end is here? Do you guys understand what short ends are? Yeah. <laughs> So like basically when, when features are shot on film, um, the leftover, like they will cut a scene and they'll change the mag. So whatever's left on the, instead of throwing it away, they'll resell it. So it's like a, they'll take the one every two minutes left of the reel and so you'll get 200 feet or 400 feet or what, like sometimes off a thousand foot mag, you'd, there would be like 500 feet, up, like, like there, there's still like, yeah, the, like uh, so you, you, then you, you buy, I might, like when I first started, it was 10 cents a foot. Now it's gone up to like 60 cents a foot. But, um, uh, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Any, well, we we're talking about just ways of supporting your career. Like, yeah. is there, I guess, like you're part of the DGA, you say it's an old boys club. Well, I just, no, I'm not saying, no, it's just, the DJ, is it, you're saying, like, how will it get you work? Or, yeah, you just have, you have to, you have to join, you're forced to join. Yeah, what gets you work? Like, yeah. is, is, you, you get yourself work. You, you, you yourself basically work. you right. you unless you want to make ads, like if you want to make commercials for a living, um, then then you get sent. You have an uh, you have a rep. Like a, I'm with Epoch in the states, and they send me. They'll send me a, an ad agency. Will send me a a deck, and it will be like whatever for Nike, and then you have to put together like a 60 page treatment for free and then have a bunch of calls and then you win or you don't win the job and you're pitching against other directors. Um, so that, so that will, process, right? that's a bidding process. Um, it takes a few weeks and then, um, and then the shoots usually last a month or so and then the edit, which, so whatever, but it's, um, but that will give you a director's day rate, which is depending whatever you've worked out with your, with your rep. Um, 
they, you are able to make a living that way. But um, if you want to, but, that, but then you're very creatively restricted. You're basically just, you have a creative director on set who is delegating to you um, essentially the, what they've sold through to the client. And the client is very, everyone's very afraid. All the decisions are based on fear of like, you know, either the, the ad agency is afraid of losing the client. And then the client's afraid of not being relevant or not cool or whatever. And so you're trying to like, you're just holding everyone's hand and you're like a therapist <laughs> to try to make this brand be like, don't worry, you're going to be cool. I'm going to make you look cool. This will be like a great ad. Um, so then you creatively you really run dry because you stop listening to your instincts, which is also a big threat as an artist because you are constantly just appeasing, appeasing, appeasing the client. Um, for Aquafina, and you're like... This is going to be really great, like Aquafina. Um, and then you're not listening to the voice inside of you, which is like your creative drive and, and your instincts and your vision. And like, yeah, like the whatever um, s sacred space you have as, a, uh, as an artist and, and that needs to be protected and you can just lose yourself. Uh, I know I have people that, I know people that went into commercials being like, yeah, I'm just going to do this for a few years and then I'm going to make my feature and they never make their feature, and then all their kids go to private school, and they like have two houses and four cars, and they, they're just never getting out of that lifestyle. And uh, so that is a trap of, like, if you want to go the commercial profit route, or being, a, even, a, even as a TV show director for hire, I, I'm from the world of, like, I want to make films that I want to write, and I want to, I want to have a really clear... Um, you know, I want to make a piece. Of, I want to make a piece of work that's my own, and um, like similar to like what, what I learned here, like as being an artist. So, I need to raise the money to do that, and it's through like active, um, daily, <laughs> like hard work of just. I'm writing four hours today. I'm writing a screenplay today, and I will sit down and I will write every day. Um, I and that's and then I and then when I'm not doing that, I'm writing for grants. And then, or I'm um, going to, I have a management in the States and I'm going, we're gonna go shop my script around to, um, to studios and to um, film financers. And that's, that's like, that's where you go and you pitch um, and try to raise some funds that way. So I think everything is, there's no, there's no, like, you're not, uh, it's all about how hard you want to work and how much work you put into getting and how badly you want it. Because um, I don't think anyone is, um, no one's, yeah, there's no other incentive but your own, I think, in this, in this game, I think. Great answer. Yeah. Um, we're kind of running low on time. I just want to give Kevin a little of an opportunity. To, like, is there um, an association or something that has helped you that gets you work or is it mostly, is it similar experience to everybody else? It's about building your reputation or what, what, what is getting you the work at this point? I mean, I would say more important than joining any particular organization is just like connecting with the community. It doesn't take too much time to get to know everybody in the Canadian film and television landscape. You can certainly get Vancouver done in a year, and then you could move on to the rest of the country. Um, and so it's worth like going to film festivals. Like that's I. The reason I got the aforementioned internship that I did between my third and fourth year was I was volunteering at the Vancouver International Film Festival from like first year. Um, I was yeah. I and you, you get a pass, and so you get to go see a bunch of movies at the film fest, and that was my like other film education. It's kind of connected to all of that, and that. That's how I got to meet other filmmakers and people. Like, as Emily said, you, you make films with other people, so you need to know how to ask somebody to become your cinematographer, or your editor, or your production designer. And there's no better way to do that than hang out in film circles. So I'd say, you know, there are organizations, like once you're no longer a student, you should join the Documentary Organization of Canada if you want to be making documentaries. Or you can, you know, I'm a member of DOC, I'm a member of the Canadian Media Producers Association, I'm a member of the Directors Guild of Canada. Um, but again, I'd say like going to VIF, going to DOXA, the Documentary Film Festival, and going to film festivals. There's a ton of smaller festivals now too. There's Vancouver Short Film Festival, Vancouver Asian Film Festival, 
heck, there's the Chilliwack Film Festival, which actually has really great programming in the last couple of years. So like, go to film festivals and there's always gonna be talks and panels that you will learn from, but also get to meet other people who are attending those. And there's events and parties. And I find, honestly, like, building your own kind of community of other film friends, that's, that's, that goes to everything both of, everybody here has been saying is like, you, you need a community, you need support networks, you need friends who will have your back and kind of help you make a film and also kind of support you when the, the, in the dark days when it's stressful. So that would be my recommendation instead of an association. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, yeah, I, I echo that. Um, Okay, I just I I'm getting the rap signal. Uh, for uh, w yeah, I just want to make sure that we get some questions in from you guys because these guys have been so generous with their with their time and and with their answers. But I'm thinking that maybe you have some questions that you'd like to. This one I put on mute, so you might have to get it back going. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? There's a question at the back. <laughs> Such a big room at the back. You're, you're Kevin, right? And yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you were volunteering at the Vancouver International Film Festival. And you know how that's like only in like October to like... Yeah, it's not right? great for... Timing when you're in school, I know that, but... So, um, when you were not able to volunteer in those timelines, was there any other place that you, like, volunteered or had experiences on, other than, like, the theater thing that you told us about? I, like, I volunteered on, like, film sets and stuff, like, in that, I'd do that in the summer when I wasn't, you know, in school. Um, I'm trying to remember. I remember, like, being a production assistant on some friend's short film or something, um, like, a, my brother, my older brother's friend, um, that's a that's a slippery slope though, and it kind of connects to you know some of the um, what I'll call it the golden handcuffs that Emily was talking about. Like I know a lot of people. Like I I don't know if you do want to volunteer in a lower capacity on a film set because sometimes that can be a trap. People end up like, oh, I'm actually getting great money as a lamp hopper or a grip or whatever, and then they work there for 20 years because they get paid really well, but then they never get to make their own films. So more people than not who I know, and Siri didn't understand that. Uh, more people than not, I know who went into that, who are like, yeah, I'm just gonna be a PA temporarily to pay the bills, and they rise up through the ranks, they become an a, a, a tad, a third, a second, a first AD, and then that's their life. And then 20 to 30 or 40 years go by, and they never made a film because they were making good money, and they bought a house, and then they had to feed that. So I am cautious of volunteering on film sets <laughs> or working on film sets. Um, that's just my opinion. But volunteering for film festivals, and there's also organizations, like I said, like the Doxa Film Festival. You can sometimes find things where they need people to help out on weekends. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has better ideas. Um, I just want to add to that a little bit. Like, so it's important, and I know you all know this because you're here, you're going to school, but there's a distinction needs to be made between all of these guys and, and, and the production service industry that is out there that Kevin is referring to. That production service industry is a meat grinder. So what it does, and, and I've worked in it, um, what it does is it takes you in, as Kevin is saying, gives you a job, and it gives you an opportunity and it gives you a chance to make a living. But as Emily is also saying, um, it's very difficult to make your own content at the same time because you're exhausted. You're working 12, 14 hours. Sometimes you're going into OT and the dollar signs are ringing. And so you say to yourself, is this what I want to do? And it, 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 it only lasts so long because it takes a lot of energy and then you realize you turn around and you've got the four car garage and the. And you, to be clear, yeah. zero judgment on that as a yeah. choice. If that's your active choice, fine. That's totally yes. fine. If the stress I see is from people who think that they can do the other thing while doing that. And I just think if you're trying to do both, it's really hard to live two totally different lives um, at the same time. So if you want to commit to that, if you want to, no, I have zero like criticism of anybody that chooses to work on a, an American film set and have a perfectly good life. Yeah, and, and that was what Vancouver offers in a way, those choices. But I just, I want to read, 
<clears throat> but that that could also be that was like my film school experience. Like I don't think I would been able to make anything if I had not done all those commercials. But um, and I have a good friend uh, Jared Boyce who's a, who's a first AC here, and now he's basically starting a directing career because of all the hour, thousands of hours he's worked on like. 20 features and maybe I'm misquoting, but he's <laughs> big, big movies. Like he just did the Nicolas Cage film and um, uh, he's, he's just, he's worked, he, he's just, and yet now he's like, he's starting to, to I, I can see that he's now branching out into directing and it's, and I don't, I don't think he would have been able to do that had he not had all those thousands of hours on set, but he has definitely grinded himself. <laughs> like he's, he's like in, worked, you know, 15, 16 hour days, some days. And it's, it's a, uh, I, I think that that could be, uh, if you are able to have good boundaries, uh, you just need to not um, lose track of time and energy and be able to, because you can do, you know, it's like the one for one model of like one for the, which is how, you know, back in the day, um, Coppola or whatever, they would make a film for uh, hire, like they would make a one for the studio and then one for themselves. And I think that like, I mean, I, I worked as a nanny and washed dishes and I did like a million like, <laughs> like you know, um, uh, jobs that, that weren't in the film world and I, cause I had to support myself out of art school um, for like, a, yeah, like it was like just scraping by paying rent and it was, you know, I, in Montreal where I didn't really speak French so I was like taking really low like service jobs, like scraping, the, like mopping floors of like a weird, you know, theater. And like I was doing, it was busting tables and whatnot, but it was, uh, I think working in the film world would be more beneficial than that. But uh, having boundaries where you don't lose, don't just get comfortable if that's not what, yeah. And that's, I think that's the fear is that you, like 20 years go by and you get really comfortable with that steady income and you're known and you can't, the phone's ringing and you don't know when to say like no i'm working <laughs> i'm i'm working on my feature and i think the cost of living is so high now that it's really really, really hard to uh, to pay the bills and save up money to make your passion project and i like montreal where my rent was $200 a month you know <laughs> I, it was it was uh maybe that this was 2012 so maybe i don't maybe the rent's gone up but the rent rent control in montreal yeah no but i mean i had roommates but like uh rent control in in, in montreal is like it's 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 real like they can you can only raise the residential rent by ten dollars a year legally so it is one of the cheapest places to live in canada so it is like a, a mecca of artists from like expats from all over the country like uh move there for that reason because they can live and work um for free like or like for cheap <laughs> so i just don't want to i don't want to be misquoted as saying that like that uh, i just don't want to yeah i don't want to be misquoted sorry <laughs> That's okay. Um, can we get to another question? More questions for this esteemed panel? Uh, this gentleman in the front here. With the great snacks, by the way. <laughs> um, so, for, uh, I guess the question is that, I mean, you guys mentioned, like, you want to work with people you trust in, like, production and everything, right? But, like, what happened if you work with new people and then you don't have a trust for, for them to do the correct work that you wanted? And, I mean, of course, like, communication is key, but also there's, but sometimes you cannot, you just, just cannot find the right people to do the right thing. Then what should you do to build the trust, like, the initial trust before moving forward to the productions kind of thing? So yeah, I, so I guess rephrasing, it's just like how do you build trust hmm. with people okay. in your team kind of thing. Does any one of you want to take that on? I can give a shot. And were you about to? Uh, I was going to say something very quick. Very quick. Um, I guess like sometimes through referral is, is helpful if you have friends that also do the same thing and they work with, you know, ha have a similar vision or some some level of like you know, visual consistency that you like, you can be like, hey, who uh, who helped you on that? Are they okay with like, you know, maybe working with me or I, this is what I can offer. This is, maybe I can pitch to them the project, we'll trade and like, it's all a communication, like you said, like, com yeah, communication and just reputation. trying reputation as well. 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of the skills of being a filmmaker is you kind of have to learn how to like collaborate in what by most other standards would be a fairly intimate way pretty quickly in short order and you might not have a lot of lead up time with that person beforehand. So you got to be a good gauge of like both how to how to read somebody else but also communication skills. It really comes down, I mean, that's, you know, most of the job of directing is communication skills, whether it's communicating your vision to your cinematographer so it becomes manifest or to your actors and your cast so that they know what you want and how to make adjustments. It's all really about communicating. Um, but I would say it's, if you're like trying to find who to trust, yeah, you, you definitely, it's nice to find like um, a group that you can rely upon and that's why you see lots of great filmmakers work with the same crew over and over and the same cast over and over. It's because they don't want to mess with something if it's not broke. I mean like, Clint Eastwood famously uses the same crew, um, and despite him being my namesake, I do not have any relationship to him. Um, and he, like, famously, like, you don't get on a Clint Eastwood movie unless somebody else dies, and that spot becomes vacant. Like, his crews are a tight, well-oiled machine for a reason, and you kind of get that. Um, unfortunately, in Canada, you rarely get to have that opportunity to build that up because... It's just, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but like you rarely get to work with the same people as often as that. So I find I have to, I've had to get, I have a favorite cinematographer who I'd hire for every project if I could, but most of the time, well, half the time he's just too busy because he's really, really good. But like I have had to learn in recent years how to basically get that same kind of connection or kinship with somebody I haven't worked with. And that's hard and it's not ideal, but you kind of figure it out. What I would say, though, is when you're trying to make your first film, you always have to, like, yeah, find somebody who has the skills that you don't have, whether it be the cinematographer or an editor or whomever. I would always be wary of hiring somebody that's at a way different level than you. You want somebody to be working on the film who's getting as much out of it as you. If you're making your first short film, that is a huge deal for you. That's hugely valuable. And you might think, oh, I'm going to hire this person who's got all these huge credits. They might even have big awards, they might have shot movies. Lots of people do that, and it often creates an imbalance in that kind of power dynamic between those two individuals, because that person with a way longer resume thinks they know way more than you as the director do, because this is your first short film, and you are so lucky that they're even dining themselves to be on your set. And you don't want that, that's a really bad, toxic, potentially toxic, like, um, dynamic. So be wary of that. Hire somebody who may be as inexperienced as you, but is talented and has something to prove and is going to get so much out of working on your film that they're going to go flat out. You want the person that's there, you know, for 14 hours for free because they want to be, because they need that film to look great. That's going to be a way more valuable outcome for you. Um. I think that's part of why, like, uh, the Daniels' success is, like, they they have worked with the exact same tight crew from their very first music video to their Oscar-winning feature. And I think that even, like, Paul Rogers, who's, like, edited three films, won the Oscar for... And he's, like... <laughs> during his acceptance speech, he's, like, I've only edited three movies, guys. but And he's... Uh, winning an Oscar for editing because like they could have gotten like any editor like you know making a film with A24 at that level they 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 were like no we're gonna we're gonna use our turn down for what editor and uh and so he has very few credits but yeah he like I think the reason why they were able to achieve that level of a film which is like has like the shot list is like illegible like how in how insanely ambitious it is and what they were able to achieve shooting in Los Angeles for, for very little money is because um, when you think of the scope of it, I mean, it's a big budget film, but like they were able to get like uncountable amount of shots and the boards are just like mind blowing. And, and that's because they ha had this like summer camp where, and it wasn't even like the word that I hear is that nobody felt exploited at all, which is like, insane for like how many days they shot and how many shots were in a day and what was like on the schedule is just like um and you're like how is that possible that they didn't exploit anybody and no one felt like overworked or exhausted it's like because they had these like you know if you look at the behind the scenes stuff or like what you hear stories of people they were like every morning they did like yoga together and they did chants and cheering and cheerleading and they like they did like all this ice breaking like fun like silly crazy games with their crew that like brought them all together as this like yeah like a well oiled machine and that is like more valuable than having at 200 million dollars i think because 
Um, if you're just dragging people along, like a cult leader, and getting them to like mo you know motivate them, being like, come on, let, let just have one more shot at it, and everyone's just like, what are we doing? And who are you? And like uh, uh, versus like you have all your friends that like that that are like, this is like you know what's the next thing? Like what what are we doing? Like yeah, like I see the vision and I'm on board, and they're all collaborators. Like they can also see it's not just you being a crazy like the only enlightened person with the vision, everyone else sees the vision too because they're all, and you and they all are contributing towards that vision and you're trusting them with their own skills to, to contribute um, their unique, like they're bringing, the, the, the caution person feels like they're really contributing something and you really trust them and you give them the creative freedom to make their crazy costumes. Um, you know, that you can steer and you can give input in, but you're really letting them you know, be their own artist in, in within your framework. So, like, I, I just think that's the most valuable thing that I've learned in my <laughs> in my ten years of trying to, and, and also trusting your gut. Like, you really, when you meet somebody, you have a feeling about them, and it, it's like dating. You really have to trust that gut, because then later on, you're like, oh, I should have listened to my gut, man. I knew first day meeting them, like, you know, after a bad breakup, you're like, I always knew deep down. Uh, you, you really do. I really so so as as highly recommended as they come. You really have to feel them, like listen to that that gut feeling you have. Um, that's it. Yes. Bad, bad breakups. <laughs> um, do, do we have another question out there? We have time for one more. I think. No more questions. Don't be shy. Might be like, the last time we see all three of us. They're like, stop talking. Forget what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I want to thank Kevin and Emily and Jen and, and just they—they they were so giving of their time and, and it, really great answers. And so. Um, Without further ado, I'll turn it over to the to the mingling and thank Shannon uh, for for putting this together and Jem Ray and Ashley. And Teresa, I'm sorry, and Teresa, I, w I was blanking on your name for a second. I wasn't trying to not remember you. Okay. Can I just 